Look out onto any road, in any country, and it won't take long to see a Volkswagen car drive by. After all, until 2017, Volkswagen were the largest car maker in the world. But as you're about to discover, the company has a very dark history. And some may say their evil ways continue to this very day. The idea for Volkswagen started with Adolf Hitler. That's right. It turns out that while plotting world domination by the Aryan race, Hitler couldn't help looking over at the United States and feeling jealous of their cars. You see, in the late 1930s, more than half of US households owned a car. In Germany, however, cars were still a luxury that only the rich could afford. That didn't sit well with him. So he came up with a plan. Hitler's goal was to mass produce a car that could be sold for just 1,000 Reichmarks, about 140 US dollars. He wanted it to be very cheap so that everyone could afford it, which is why the company was called Volkswagen. Literally translated from German, it means the people's car. Hitler admired Henry Ford, another famous anti-Semite, and wanted to create the German equivalent of the Model T. And who did he employ to bring his vision to life? None other than Ferdinand Porsche. Now, if that name reminds you of this Porsche, then you're right. Ferdinand Porsche, better known for his racing cars, was a member of both the National Socialist Party and the SS. And perhaps more importantly, he had a special talent for designing modern, practical cars. The design Porsche came up with is what we now know as the Beetle, a small, round car with a simple design that uses air to cool its engine. It's a design that was so effective that it would eventually leapfrog past the Model T as the most sold car in the world. But that would take a while. First came a world war. By the time the first Volkswagen factory was built in Wolfsburg, Germany, it was 1938. German citizens had started making down payments for the brand new car. But within a year, Germany invaded Poland and Britain and France declared war in response. As a result, all production for Beetle cars stopped. Overnight, Volkswagen switched to producing military vehicles. But this is where the story takes a very sinister turn. And this time, it's not just Hitler that's to blame. The Volkswagen factory in Wolfsburg is an immense building that was meant to supply the entire German people with affordable cars. But to supply an entire country, you need a very large workforce. And as the war broke out and men were drafted to fight in the German army, labor quickly became scarce. That was when Ferdinand Porsche made a sinister suggestion to Hitler. Why not force Eastern Europeans to work in the factory? After all, Russians, Poles, and Scandinavians, while not as hated as Jews, were still seen as racially inferior compared with pure-blooded German Aryans. To someone with such a twisted view of race, the idea made perfect sense. Hitler immediately got on board. As the German army advanced through Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and beyond, German police transferred thousands of hapless Eastern Europeans to the Volkswagen factory, some of them from concentration camps, some straight from their villages. Pretty soon, these prisoners made up around 70% of Volkswagen's workforce. For the workers, conditions were atrocious. This was slave labor. They barely received enough food to live on and were worked to the bone, without pay, day in and day out. And as the war dragged on and food shortages became more and more common throughout Germany, Volkswagen officials would steal what little food the prisoners had, leaving them to literally starve to death. But it gets worse. By the end of the war, with Germany fighting on all fronts, their army needed more military vehicles. So the Germans started bringing thousands of women to the factories. Some of these women were, or later became, pregnant. Now, before March 1943, the Nazi official policy was to send pregnant women back to their hometowns. But Volkswagen, not wanting to lose any workers, lobbied to change the policy and keep the women at the factories. Volkswagen set up a Kinderheim, that is, a children's home, where the infants were supposed to be cared for while the mothers returned to work. On the face of it, it doesn't sound so bad, but this so-called nursery was about as far from a typical image of a nursery as you can imagine. The building that housed the infants 
was a scene of hundreds of squirming bodies struggling to survive. The babies received just half a liter of milk and one and a half sugar cubes each day. There was minimal adult supervision, and insects bit the defenseless babies incessantly. Windows were left open despite the freezing winter temperatures, and diapers were left unchanged. Essentially, the Kinderheim was a place where newborn children were sent to die. And these prisoners worked under these terrible conditions until, finally, in 1945, American troops liberated them and finally took control of the Volkswagen plants. The end of the war should have been the end of Volkswagen. You see, given their role in helping the German army, the Allies planned on dismantling the company completely. And had it not been for a British officer by the name of Major Ivan Hurst, that would have been the case. But the thing was, Major Hurst saw the potential in the highly efficient Beetle and persuaded his superiors to resume production. The British military soon put in an order for 20,000 Beetles, and that was just the beginning. The Beetle became the perfect vehicle for a country that was trying to rebuild following the devastating war. Although the German economy was doing badly, the car was cheap enough for regular Germans to afford, and the Beetle didn't stop at the borders of Germany. By 1947, Volkswagen started exporting to other countries, and by 1949, it reached the United States. The Beetle became immensely popular in Europe during the 1950s. Sales surged, and the car came to represent the success of the post-war recovery effort. There was just one hitch. In the US, the Beetle was seen as a bit of an oddity. Its rounded shape and small size didn't fit in with the style of the day, but a clever and daring ad campaign changed America's perception of the car by portraying its small size as a strength, rather than a weakness. Then, during the 1960s, the Beetle further cemented its place in American culture when the counter-cultural movement adopted it as a symbol of non-conformity. And in 1972, 30 years after his death, the Beetle, the car first dreamt up by Hitler, finally achieved what he'd set out to do. He surpassed the Ford Model T as the most produced car ever. But the golden age for Volkswagen didn't last. Its popularity among American consumers began to wane by the late 1970s. Korean and Japanese cars flooded the market. The tiny bug just couldn't compete. Now, if this was simply a story about the Beetle, there might not be much left to say. But this investigation is about Volkswagen the company. And if my investigation has shown me anything, it's that this company could never really leave its dark history behind it. No matter how hard they try to gloss things over with slick marketing campaigns or popular movies, some pretty shady stuff was going on behind the scenes. Now, by the 1950s and 60s, the Beetle was in practically every corner of the globe, including a rapidly industrializing Brazil. A Brazil that, from 1964 to 1985, suffered under a repressive military dictatorship. Hundreds of people were killed and thousands more tortured and imprisoned during that time. And Volkswagen played a part in it. In 2014, Volkswagen faced allegations of having helped the Brazilian dictatorship. According to sources, Volkswagen officers gave the names of their own employees who were against the ruling Brazilian dictatorship. Those employees were then detained, tortured, and even executed. All of this took place not in a prison, but in Volkswagen's factories. For its part, Volkswagen waited until 2016 to finally admit their role in these atrocities. It was only in 2020 that they agreed to pay $6.4 in compensation to the families of those who were affected. They issued a statement saying, We regret the violations that occurred in the past. Meanwhile, elsewhere, the scandals continued to pile up. With their sales dropping throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Volkswagen began to look for ways to get ahead of its competition. In the 1990s, General Motors accused Volkswagen of having stolen thousands of pages of documents, which included valuable trade secrets. While not officially admitting guilt, Volkswagen issued a statement saying they acknowledged the possibility that illegal activities by some executives who defected from GM to VW may have occurred. Volkswagen eventually settled the case by paying $100 million to GM 
plus agreeing to buy at least one billion of auto parts from the American company over a seven-year period. Hardly the actions of an innocent party. I think you'll agree. Then, there was the so-called Perks and Prostitutes affair. This scandal involved Volkswagen providing union leaders with all kinds of gifts in order to keep them compliant. VIP passes to nightclubs, visits to brothels, and luxury trips where Volkswagen paid for Viagra and other aphrodisiacs for its board members. These expenses added up to a startling 2.6 million. And this was a company whose numbers were plummeting into the red. But there was one other shortcut that Volkswagen took that would have enormous consequences for the company. A large percentage of Volkswagen cars have diesel engines. In 2018, around 43% of all their cars sold were diesel. The benefit of diesel is that it is more fuel efficient than other fuel. The downside is that it is generally noisier, smellier, and emits harmful byproducts into the environment. Now, Volkswagen did a pretty good job in reducing the emissions in its diesel engines, but the US has very strict limits on nitrogen oxides, much stricter than Europe's. Try as they might to reduce the emissions in their engines, Volkswagen just couldn't meet the US standards. So, they cheated. They created a software that was fitted into their diesel cars, 12 million cars worldwide, 482,000 in the US alone. What did this software do? Well, its job was to detect when a car was being tested for emissions. If it realized it was being tested, it would make the engine run cleaner, thereby passing the test. But once returned to the road, the cars would immediately start pumping out higher rates of pollutants, 40 times higher than what is allowed in the US, in fact. This evil plan worked perfectly for Volkswagen between 2009 and 2015. Then they got caught. The scandal rocked the automobile industry and destroyed Volkswagen's image of a clean car company. What started as a US scandal spread worldwide. In total, VW has had to recall over 12 million cars around the globe to refit engines. Globally, between the fines, settlements, and engine refits, the scandal has cost the company over 34 billion. And that's not including the huge hit to their share price and the loss of public trust, especially given how heavily they were advertising their supposedly green credentials during the period. But now we all know better, right? The thing is, Volkswagen isn't the only company out there with a dark history. I bet you never knew how shady Lego are. 